Dr. Elisa Song, welcome to the True Grit and Grace podcast. I've been so excited to have you on. Thank you for being here. Oh, thank you, Amberly. I'm honored to be here and, and talk with you and your audience. Yes, I've been, well, as we were talking before we started, I've been stalking you and soaking in <laughs> all the information that you share. And really what attracted me to you most was your passion for what you do. So before I've got so many topics I want to talk to you about, your hot topics, including COVID and the health you know, concerns that our children are going through right now. But before we get started with that, can you just share a little bit about your upbringing and what inspired you to become a doctor? Hmm. Well, it's, it's interesting because my mother, so um, she grew up in South Korea during the Korean War um, and, and she was raised by her mother. Uh, her father passed when she was really young. So my aunt and my mother were, um, you know, these daughters of a school teacher. And I think, you know, my grandmother always instilled in them the importance of education, even back then growing up in the 40s and 50s in Korea. And um, she just had this drive to, to learn and to serve. And she's really been my inspiration. And, you know, she immigrated to, well, actually, I should back up. She was actually one of five women in her graduating medical school class. I mean, wow. that was a huge deal back then. Wow. And so she came to the United States, I mean, halfway around the world in 1968 to do her residency in OBGYN in New York. So, I mean, just so brave and such a pioneer. I mean, I can't even imagine doing that you know, on my own back then, right? Mm -hmm. When it was so hard to stay connected, there was no FaceTime, there was no Zoom. I mean, yeah. phone calls were, were hard and very expensive, um, but she did it and she built this thriving practice. And the funny thing is growing up, I never wanted to be a doctor. I mean, that was like the last thing I wanted to do. I'm like, I'm not gonna do what my mom did, you know? But, you know, as I, as I went to college, I really, I recognized that my passion was really to serve children. Oh. So I didn't know if that meant being a teacher. Um, I actually took the LSATs. I was going to be a civil rights lawyer and work for the Children's Defense Fund. I mean, they were all of these, you know, these dreams of mine. Um, and then when it came down to it, I realized, you know, I really want to work with kids on a day to day basis. And, you know, being in Washington, D.C., fighting for kids rights. I mean, that's amazing and so needed, but I probably wouldn't work with kids that much. So it was my literally the summer between my junior and senior year, I decided to go to medical school. So I was scrambling and, you know, and then what was fascinating then, you know, life just happens in the way it's meant to. So as soon as I decided, okay, I'm going to take the MCATs, I'm, I'm going to be a pediatrician. I remember I was, I went to, I did my undergraduate at Stanford and I saw this flyer on a, a big um, uh, telephone pole. And whatever, who knows what got into me as a, you know, a 20 year old to look at this flyer and think, oh, I might be interested in that. It was a flyer for a meeting at the Santa Clara Convention Center for the American Holistic Medical Association, which doesn't exist anymore. It's kind of morphed into other organizations. Mm -hmm. But I went, I don't even remember how I got there because there was no Uber and I don't think I had a car, <laughs> you know, wow. but, but I, I went and I was just fascinating because there were speakers that now are very well known, but back then were hardly known. Um, Deepak Chopra, wow. Andrew, yeah, Andrew Weil. I mean, they were just kind of coming out with this new field of, of holistic medicine, integrative medicine. And so I remember going back to my mom and saying, you know what? I want to be a doctor, but I want to be a naturopathic doctor. And she's like, what is that? <laughs> So, so even back then, I mean, and I ended up, I mean, no one in my circle of friends or family knew what a naturopathic doctor was back then. I remember getting the application, you know, to best year. And so the timing wasn't right for that. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't have enough support to pursue that, but in a way, I'm so glad that I was able to pursue a medical doctorate degree so I could really fully understand the conventional world and then still pursue this passion that was always in the back of my mind once I finished residency to learn acupuncture and homeopathy and, and nutrition and functional medicine. So I love what I do now. I wouldn't practice medicine any other way. Well, I think it's so important. And, you know, I wish that I 
and my mother knew doctors like you when I was growing up, um, I just thought of something, you know, when I was little, I, I had um, constant kidney infections and bladder infections. And from the time I was in diapers, my mom discovered that something wasn't right. And so I had to have a surgery when I was very young mm. and I was on medication and I never liked taking the medication. <laughs> and my mom told me that she used to find pills hidden all over the house. <laughs> I would put them in plants and under furniture. Now, I don't know why I didn't just throw them in the trash or I didn't, <laughs> or I didn't speak up and say, mom, I don't want to take this medicine. There has to be another way. But I, I love your, your approach in that it seems like you really look outside the box and you approach mind, body, and spirit healing. And I want to backtrack to something else that you said about you just happened to look up at this sign at this, this post. And that, that led you to go to hear these speakers, which really changed your life. You were like, this is what I want to do. And it, I, I see in everything that you share that you are very aware of the little signs like you you had a post about the hummingbird and what mm -hmm. the hummingbird represents to you. And I think that if we're all a little more, if we open our eyes and we're awake and we pay attention to what's going on, we can be aware of those little signs that guide us. We can be more in tune with our bodies and listen to our bodies and, and find other answers. But I wanted to ask you a hot topic around our house, mm -hmm. um, speaking of, you know, all different kinds of medicines and vaccines and stuff is we've been talking about COVID and the vaccine. Mm -hmm. And I'm so curious to know what you think about the vaccine, because for me, I'm like, I, and some people might think this is crazy, but I don't really want to take the vaccine right away. I'm like, no, let's let them test that for, I don't want that. But my husband is going to be first in line. Like he, and so, and I'm also not one to go get a flu shot. I would rather do other things to build up my immunity than go get a shot of something and take the risk of getting sick. I don't know. Everybody had each, each their own, uh, opinion about it, but that's right. I'm very curious to think, how do you feel about the vaccine and what would you suggest for families like me who I'm like, I don't want our daughter getting the vaccine. I don't want the vaccine. And my husband's like, oh, she's getting the vaccine. You're getting the vaccine. <laughs> Yeah. You know, this is, it's such a hot button topic. And even before the COVID-19 vaccine was even, you know, a thought, um, you know, in the years past, it's been such a challenging issue for parents to navigate. And, you know, the one thing that I tell parents is, um, and, you know, I just posted this on Instagram because I had to make it really clear that I, I am not 100% anti-vaccine. I am not 100% pro-vaccine. What I am is 100% pro-child. Mm -hmm. And I really believe that taking a personalized approach to your child's health and well-being is really key to helping them thrive in the long run. Mm -hmm. And with this COVID-19 vaccine, what we do know is there's never ever been a vaccine that's been fast tracked like this before. And even the heads, you know, uh, Dr. Fauci, Dr. Paula Offit, who is one of the most staunch vaccine advocates, have very you know big concerns about a fast track vaccine. Now there's been reports, and you know in pandemic times things change from week to week. And you know by the time this airs, we we may be in a different position. But at the moment, there are a couple of vaccines who are uh, just came out with news that they are over ninety percent effective, over ninety five percent five percent effective. And if there is a safe and an effective vaccine for this pandemic, I think that would be wonderful. But the key mm -hmm. is safe and effective. So we might have the effective piece, but safety really requires long-term studies. Mm -hmm. um, what we do know is, you know, for, for instance, for Pfizer and for Moderna for their vaccines, um, once they can show effectiveness, they they need at least two months of following uh, patients in the trials to determine safety. So we still have a little ways to go. And then what people need to remember is, um, 
even once a vaccine receives the emergency use authorization by the FDA because it's being fast tracked, it's called the EUA, um, it's still not going to be widely available for for like the common folks like us, right? I mean, yeah. it's just it, we're not going to have that option for a while. I mean, there's still major. Uh, questions, you know, uh, and, and ethical concerns about, well, who should be first in line for the vaccine? Should it be, you know, the frontline healthcare workers? Should it be essential workers? I mean, who's going to be in line for that? And, mm -hmm. you know, perhaps I might be as a pediatrician in a clinic, but for the most part, most of us, we're going to be waiting, you know, well into 2021. Um, there is a concern from rheumatologists that, you know, what we don't know about this vaccine because it's an mRNA technology, which is a technology that has been around for a while. It's been around for quite a while, but we haven't used this particular kind of vaccine in human beings. So we don't know. Oh, um, that's the so interesting because mm -hmm. just last night, my husband was like, oh, and this is a vaccine that has been tested on humans and <laughs> And I'm well, like, it has been, but but we haven't used it for years and years and years in humans. Oh. We've never used this kind of technology. So the vaccines that your children get are not mRNA vaccines. And there, there are concerns regardless with vaccines possibly triggering autoimmunity. And some of the top rheumatologists, you know, even at Cleveland Clinic, you know, highly respected centers have concerns that we just don't know. You know, there's this, there was a, a statement that was made. There's a quote, small elephant in the room which I would take is a big elephant in the room yeah. um, of whether or not this vaccine could worsen autoimmunity in patients. Um, and so, wow. you know, I think we just have to step back and see, you know, we all have our different experiences and um, emotions around mm -hmm. vaccines. But what I encourage parents to do is not make these decisions based on fear one way or the other, really try to, you know, get the research as much as possible and base your opinions on the evidence at hand. And, you know, for families who, you know, want to be first in line for the vaccination, understanding that there may be some risks that we don't know because we're not going to have years and years of studies um, and supporting your kids. I mean, that's what I do. You know, I, I do give vaccines in the office and I help children prepare. And so we just want to know for some kids, if they are having trouble with detoxification or mitochondrial issues or, you know, methylation issues, we can support your child so that they can more um, safely receive vaccines without the, with the positive benefits, without the unintended negative effects. Well, I think what you said is so powerful. Make your decision, not from a place of fear, but from the facts, like look at the facts and each child or person as an individual. And I think that's important with everybody and their feelings and how safe they feel getting back into the real world world as yeah. things start to open up and which who knows every day it's, it's just changing every day. And, and sometimes I think, Oh, it's starting to open up and, you know, the gym opened and Oh, Nope, it's closed again. Yep. And, and, you know, I think it's, Part of our resilience is being able to kind of adjust quickly and go with the flow. And, um, and well, I think if anything, you know, this year, I mean, it's all about resilience, right? Mm -hmm. And you talk about resilience and we need this emotional resilience and physical resilience. And, you know, for me, I talk about, well, how do we build that cellular resilience, mm -hmm. right? No matter what happens, our cells, our emotions, our body, we, we take hits every day. That's mm -hmm. life right? And if we didn't have any stressors on our body, we would never have that opportunity to grow and get stronger. And so it really is about, you know, how do we understand how to build the foundations of resilience in your children, not just psychologically and emotionally, but physically and immunologically, so that whatever happens, whether it's COVID or whether it's um, school stress or whether it's the anxiety of not being around friends, we, we can come out of this. I mean, the pandemic has brought so many more stressors than we could have ever imagined. And it's testing all of our resilience, right? Mm -hmm. um, but this is an opportunity that we, I think as parents um, can, can help our children understand, well, how do we get through this in a resilient way? Not in a way that, that um, you know, uh, will have more long-term impacts that we don't want for them. Well, how would you suggest that that parents teach their kids resilience um, through some of these challenging times? Because 
I know it is, it is different. Not, you know, my daughter's still not, well, she's in virtual school. Mm -hmm. She hasn't been able to really see her friends. And so it is not just the physical, it is the emotional. And I love that you talk about as a doctor, not just the physical, but the, the spiritual aspect of it too, like how to keep your spirits up, how to keep your light shining bright throughout this. What are some of the tools that you share with your patients to make sure that they're coming out of this as resilient as they can possibly be? Mm -hmm. This is so important. I think as parents, as mothers, I mean, our kids are so in tune with how we're responding to stressful situations. And it's really important also for us to do that hard work, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. to build up our own emotional resilience, right? Because our kids, they will respond to stressors. They will look to us mm -hmm. to see how bad is this situation? How, how much danger am I in, you know, mm -hmm. physically, emotionally, whatever it is, right? You know, how should I respond? And so, you know, it's really important that for us as parents, oh, honey, it's going to be okay. We'll just, you know, pretend it's not here. You know, we're going to have our own little pod and we're going to come out, come out of it the other end because that's not realistic either, right? Mm -hmm. One of the things we know that there's an epidemic of anxiety in our kids and our teenagers. The signs of anxiety can show up, you know, most of the time for teenagers who are diagnosed with anxiety, there were signs of developing anxiety disorders, even as young as six, right? When they're in kindergarten or first grade. And what are some of those signs? What do they look like? Well, you know, for kids, of course, when they're that little, they're not necessarily going to say, mommy, I'm, you know, I'm anxious, right? That's not really a word that's used in the vocabulary. But for a lot of kids, we may find sleep disturbances, some behavior changes, um, you know, separation anxiety that's worsening, right? Uh, school refusal, um, you know, there can be um, food restrictions or cravings. I mean, you want to look to see, is there a change in behavior that is, you um, that wasn't there before that is getting worse and worse. And oftentimes parents will notice, okay, well, sure, kids starting school, of course they, they don't wanna leave my side and it's hard to, hard to move beyond. But after a month or two, um, if that's not improving, then we wanna look to see what else is going on for them, right? What, are, what, is, what is happening in their world that is making them feel unsafe about going to school, right? Um, and, and, you know, as kids get, older and older and have stressors, right? And, and, you know, when I talk about stress with kids and parents in my office, I let them know stress, that word stress, we all think, oh, stress is negative. Stress by itself is not a bad thing, right? Mm -hmm. Stress actually helps us to get things done, right? If you have mm -hmm. a deadline and you're stressed about it, you sit down and you do the work, mm -hmm. right? If we don't have a deadline, we never finish, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, if we're stressed, you know, in that fight or flight mode. And let's say we're walking in the dark and we hear footsteps behind us and our heart rate's beating. And we're like, okay, what do I do? We're ready to either fight or flee, right? That's mm -hmm. that response. It's just that when we feel that that fight or flight, we're running, we're running, running, running or freezing, right? Or um, trying to fight um, soccer practice and friend drama and family stress and, you know, homework and all of that. And we feel like we're constantly running, you know, from that proverbial saber tooth tiger, that chronic stress is what leads to anxiety disorders or immune dysfunction, right? Because mm -hmm. stress, psychological stress creates just as much inflammation as any physical stress or infection. So we need to understand that and, and know when we have these acute stressors, we want to help our children understand how to navigate those stressors, not ignore them, right? Not, not pretend like they're not there because avoidance is one of the, um, it's one of the tools that many of us have learned as parents, right? It's one of the tools that we teach our children, but avoidance is one of the worst things you can do because oh, then that it gets bigger yes. and bigger and bigger, right? It does. And, you know, I, it was all about that growing up for me. It was all about avoidance. And I tell you, it, it gets bigger and bigger and bigger until one day you're like, oh, it's so big that you you have to take a look at it because it does, it creeps up into every aspect of your life, whether as a parent, it will show up and, you know, the stressors will show up in my parenting and my relationships and my job. Mm -hmm. And so I love that you share that. Yeah, no, it's not about avoidance. It's about got to deal with it. You can't just That's because right. 
And I think um, that avoidance as we become adults, it can start to look like covering up by eating too much, drinking mm -hmm. too much, shopping too much, dating right. too much, all of that, and, you know, to avoid the big elephant in the room. Yeah, 100%. And this is where, um, you know, I have two very different children and, you know, they, they teach me so much. My, my daughter, um, she's, she's going to be 11 soon. And she's the kind of kid, she's always been the kind of kid that I would describe as really, truly innately having that grit and resilience, right? You know, even as a toddler, if she was frustrated by not being able to get, you know, a, a square into the shape sorter, she would sit there and just work at it and do it, right? When she wanted to learn how to do a cartwheel, she... <laughs> She would go quietly into her room or in the front yard and be like, what's she doing? And then like two hours later, she'd come back and be like, mommy, I can do a cartwheel, <laughs> right? Wow. So that's her. You know, I've never had to push her to overcome challenges. Um, my son, on the other hand, he's, he's my sensitive soul, right? And so when something gets frustrated, it's the tears and mommy, I can't do it. It's too hard. And that as a mother, right, that tugs at your heart. And you're like, oh, okay, let me, let, me, let me help you. Let me fix it for you. And I've, I've gotten so much better now at stepping back and saying, look, I know it's hard. I know this is challenging, but you can do hard things and let's try to problem solve this together, right? Instead of doing it for him. It's really important to have our children understand that when something is challenging or hard, they can, they can figure out how to do fix things or solve things, resolve things on mm -hmm. their own. Yeah. Right. And I think that's important because, uh, you know, I learned at a young age, I needed to, I mean, there were seven of us kids all together and my mom didn't have time to fix things <laughs> for me or do help with a lot of things. She, I mean, she's an incredible mom, but I really learned to be self-reliant. I had to learn to cook. I had to learn to get my homework done. If I wanted something, I had to learn to work for it. Mm -hmm. And for me, one of the struggles I think is I want to give my kids more than what I had. Mm -hmm. I want to help them. And it's a, it's a fine line of like giving them too much, but also showing them that they have to work for it, that they have to figure things out. That's so hard. It's, it's such a fine line. But, you know, as a parent, you just keep telling yourself when they, the, every time they can overcome a challenge, they build more confidence that mm -hmm. yes, I'm, I'm strong and I'm brave and I'm resilient. And the next challenge, they'll be able to face it even better. So, and this all comes down to, um, you know, really it, it's a whole body approach, right? When we learn resilience, and we learn these strategies to overcome challenges that actually sets the stage for our nervous system to get into more readily that parasympathetic nervous system state, right? That kind of rest, digest and heal state. It's what some people will call like the zone, right? Mm -hmm. Athletes, right? They, they, they go into that zone where they visualize and they get into that calm alert state where they know they're confident that they can succeed. Um, authors, you know, artists will, will use this the autonomic nervous system to really become more creative. Uh, people have used it to come over addictions, you know, improve attention and focus. And they're call, they call it different things, right? Mm -hmm. But bottom line, this all goes back to how do we engage our vagus nerve, right? How do we optimize something called heart rate variability? And in this time of COVID, it is fascinating because I, you know, we all think of Oh, vagus nerve, heart rate variability. Sure, let's meditate. Let's do our belly breathing. You know, let's practice gratitude. Um, but I'll do that when I have time for it, right? Right now, mm -hmm. I'm going to focus on all the other things that I need to do, like exercise and sleep and, and eat healthily, which absolutely 100% you need. But I would say that during this time, during the pandemic, where we're all, you know, experiencing stressors like we've never before, Improving our vagus nerve function is one of the best ways to build cellular resilience against infections, against whatever is going to come our way. And there's some fascinating research now, um, just two patients who were treated with in the hospital with COVID-19 uh, uh, and 
at risk for uh, being admitted to the ICU, the intensive care unit, and they did auricular transcutaneous vagus nerve stimulation, so ear clips to stimulate the vagus nerve um, at, with, a, with a protocol that was, I, I can't remember the exact protocol, but they did the same protocol for these two patients and they monitored them with blood work and of course clinical progress rapid reductions in their levels of inflammatory cytokines, especially interleukin-6, which is implicated in cytokine storm and sepsis, um, rapid clinical recovery, you know. And wow. Able to, right. Well, tell, I, I know what the vagus nerve is because I actually had a doctor that wanted to do a implant, a stimulator into my vagus nerve. Mm -hmm. Um Tell, tell our audience what exactly that is and what the vagus nerve is responsible for, because it does a lot. It's responsible for a lot of the functions of the body. But can you tell us a little bit about what it is, where it is, and what it does? Yeah. So um, there, the vagus nerve is... is it's called the wandering nerve. It's one of the longest nerves in our body um, that, that comes from our brain, kind of right through our ear, behind our ear, down our neck, to innervate, to connect with every single internal organ. Now we think of the vagus nerve with the gut, but there's also you know, uh, um, innervations that go to the kidneys and the heart. And the vagus nerve is the nerve that is responsible for that rest, digest, and heal state, that parasympathetic nervous system that balances the fight or flight sympathetic nervous system. And we need a balance. Right, you know, when we need um, when we need uh, to be on on alert, then we need the sympathetic to be up. But once the danger is gone, we need this to calm down and our parasympathetic nervous system and our vagus nerve to take hold. And we need that for optimal functioning. One of the ways that we can um, measure uh, indirectly vagus nerve functioning is something called heart rate variability. Now, heart rate variability, there are some machines that can detect that, but one of the things that we can do, you know, right here now, you could do this. You could put your finger on your, on your neck and find your heart rate, or you can use your wrist. And then as you find your heart rate, you just take a big breath in. And as we take a big breath in, our heart rate should speed up. And as we take a big, slow exhale, our heart rate should slow down. Right, that's called respiratory sinus arrhythmia, very normal. And our children should have quite a big distinction between when they breathe in and when they exhale, right? When Thank we're in you a... for that. I love just, everybody just take a deep breath. That's right. <laughs> just breathe. <laughs> well, I mean, sometimes I'm throughout my day and I'm like, my breathing is shallow. I'm not breathing. I'm forgetting to breathe. It seems That's right. Like, That's right. Know? And you know, there are so vagus nerve implants, um, the ear stimulator, the transcutaneous vagus nerve stimulators have, there's amazing research behind the physiologic benefits of getting into this parasympathetic rest, digest, and heal state. So they've used it for, um, migraine headaches, seizure disorders, um, bipolar, you know, anxiety, depression, um, inflammatory bowel disease, irritable bowel syndrome. Uh, you know, there's, there are actually approved devices for seizures and for migraine headaches and for uh, irritable bowel syndrome in children. So we I've, know- I've heard of that for, for irritable bowel syndrome as well. They were going to do an implant on me or the doctors wanted to. And I've had another, I had a spinal stimulator for mm. complex regional pain syndrome. It yes. didn't work for me, but uh, they were like, well, I think the vagus nerve stimulator would work for you. We want to try it. And then another doctor was like, no, the side effects are too great, blah, blah. And so I ended up not getting it, but I'm still curious about that. That's why I knew about the vagus nerve stimulator. Right. Have you ever heard of it being used for complex regional pain syndrome or, or do have. you even, you have? I have. And, you know, I, I would, um, I think the uh, having something implanted um, is I've had children with intractable seizure disorders, you know, have discussions with their neurologists, you know, with that, um, you know, I, it's, it's a big deal, right? It's I mean, you a big have this deal. It's like brain surgery. <laughs> yeah. So that's uh, why I was like, Oh, this is kind of scary. Cut my head open. And then, and then looking at the, 
the in when they have the I guess it's the trial stimulator and it's it looks like a big box behind your ear and my husband was like oh wow so you're gonna walk around with a big box behind your ear but yeah I would if it helped yeah. with my pain and I didn't yeah. have to live with chronic pain and I could be off of all medication heck yeah I wouldn't yeah. care if the box everybody saw a big box behind my ear I'd be like yep I can, I'm pain-free. That's, Mm -hmm. you know, that's, I would totally do it, but, but yeah, to actually implant it, it, Mm -hmm. it's a big deal. And I think that's why my other doctor was like, I don't think you should. Yeah. Well, and I think that now we, we have these, these external devices that are not implanted that you can literally, there are little, like the gamma core device is approved for seizures. And um, it's two little kind of metal electrodes that you just hold to your neck and you stimulate the vagus nerve externally. Um, There are, you know, devices that the IBS um, stim, which is approved for children with irritable bowel syndrome, it's uh, literally electrodes that are taped into uh, the ear, right around the ear at certain points. And it's left on, I believe for five days straight and found um, significant results. So before getting in uh, an implant, I would say, well, you know, I would consider an external, you know, something that you could take on and off, right? Yeah. I would consider that for sure. Mm -hmm. The yeah, other and, one was like scary. And the reason, you know, when we think about heart rate variability, there are also exercises that, you know, we as parents can do with our children that will improve that heart rate variability, improve our vagus nerve function and improve our resilience, you know, through this pandemic, because we know the optimal heart rate variability is associated with not just decreased stress, you know, improved calm, improved sensation of connectivity with others. But from an immune standpoint, it actually, some some modes of improving heart rate variability can improve our white blood cells ability to fight infections. Um, there's EFT tapping, which some people have heard of. Mm-hmm. Uh, emotional freedom technique has been found to increase the levels of IgA antibodies in our saliva, right? And our mouth is one of the first entry points for a lot of upper respiratory viruses. So there are distinct immune benefits too. So some of these things that we could do, I mean, we could do, um, you know, I, I would love if every children, a child and, and parent um, in had a gratitude and a mindfulness practice together, mm-hmm. right? Um, My daughter but, and I do, we yeah. do. I mean, and some of the things that she says, we get in bed every night and talk about what was the best thing that happened and what are you, what's one thing that you're grateful for. I mean, I have my practice in the morning where I journal and I, and Mm -hmm. that's what I do. And I send what I'm grateful for to a friend, but we get in bed. And even though my daughter doesn't take it seriously, most of the time, you know, when I'm like, what are you grateful for? And she says something silly at least I feel like I'm getting her in the practice of, of doing it. That's right. And, you know, I love that you said that, you know, we still do it. And when our, with our children, especially the younger they are, it doesn't have to be a serious, let's sit and close our eyes, you know, (laughs) think about what we have gratitude for. I mean, we want to make it fun and enjoyable, right? And, And meet them at their developmental stage. So it just becomes a part of their life. Yeah. When I, go to bed at night, I think about what, what was the best part of today? And when I wake up in the morning, I think about what am I grateful for today? Right. And it's just, it's just something that we do, but it doesn't have to be a quote, serious practice. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, And, you know, you mentioned before how you'll sometimes throughout the day, you'll just realize, okay, I'm really, I'm not breathing that much. Right. You know, when we go about our day, what happens? We breathe with our shoulders, Mm -hmm. right? We don't use our full lung capacity in our diaphragm and we take very shallow breaths and that keeps us in that sympathetic fight or flight state. And, you know, that belly breathing, the diaphragmatic breathing, right. Where, where you pretend there's a balloon under your rib cage, right. In your belly. And as you inhale, the balloon is filling up in your belly, right? Don't suck it in, right? We're getting our belly nice and inflated. And as we exhale, the balloon in our belly is deflating. Mm -hmm. And that's, you know, when we use our diaphragm, that's been shown to also improve heart rate variability. And it's this breath work that right now, as we're heading into, you know, a surge of COVID-19, that is so important. In fact, when, when my son was hospitalized with COVID-19, way yeah, back I was going to ask you what right? both of your kids had COVID, right? Both of my kids had COVID. My daughter had, you know, the more 
quote, classic symptoms. And this was, you know, literally the week after we went into lockdown, right? You know, oh, our schools goodness. closed, you know, Friday the 13th in March. And if you remember, these were the early days where, I mean, we didn't know much at all about how to treat COVID-19 in adults. We had no idea, you know, what was happening with COVID-19 in children. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, and I mean, back then it wasn't even easy to get a test. It's still mm. not easy to get a test in some places, right? Yeah. But, um, but I remember when my daughter got sick and she had a fever to 103 and I'm looking at her, I'm like, what's going on? And I'm like, we haven't, we haven't been around anyone for a week, right? Yeah. Um, and like locked up at home. And so she developed a high fever, a teensy little bit of a cough, but she did develop a little bit of shortness of breath. Um, when, when we were walking around, I remember going on, on um, walks with her and she kind of looked really labored. And I'd say, are you okay, honey? And she, she would say, oh, I feel fine. I feel fine. I actually did have a pulse oximeter to check her oxygen levels. And she did dip. I mean, normal is 97% and above. And she was about 93, 94%. So not totally normal. Um, but I did at that point, I remember I was waiting for Quest Labs to send me a box of nasal swabs to do testing. And I was yeah. waiting and waiting, right? So I couldn't even test her. Then finally, um, the, the box arrived. The first test was negative. So I'm like, oh, okay, she doesn't have COVID. This must be some weird random thing, right? Because yeah. we, we didn't realize the extent of all the false negatives back then, right? Um, and then finally, towards the end of her illness, so on day 10, she snapped out of it, no fever, like nothing had ever happened. But it was towards the end of that, that first week that I did another swab. So I'm like, this is just too weird. And she did end up positive, right? Wow. And um, now did you get sick? So that's the really fascinating thing, right? Because now we know that children tend to have more mild illness. Um, and my son was sick enough that he was hospitalized. But for the longest time, we had no idea whether or not my husband or I got COVID-19 because we didn't have any symptoms, except in retrospect, about five days before Kenzie got sick, I had this splitting four day headache wow. and a little bit of a sore throat. And I felt a little chilled, sick enough that I actually canceled my office hours, which I never do, right? Mm -hmm. But not sick enough that I was in bed all day. I'm like, I don't know, I, I must just have a headache from all the stress of all of this, right? Mm -hmm. um, and my husband had about a day of like feeling a little tight in his chest and a little GI, like I think he had a little diarrhea and tummy ache. And that was it. So. But then in July, when I had all of our antibodies tested for COVID-19, all four of us had antibodies. So wow. now and that's what's, back, right? That's what's so crazy is the different symptoms that mm -hmm. you, and you know, my little brother had COVID and he was really didn't, well, he couldn't tell us he can't talk. He lives in um, an assisted living home. And um, they tested all of the caretakers and one of the caretakers tested positive and they tested all the residents and, and he had um, COVID, but he didn't, uh, you know, didn't really have a fever. It yeah. didn't even seem like he had COVID. I mean, of course, he couldn't talk and tell us that he had a headache or whatever, but yeah. um he made it through. I was really worried because yeah, he has a sure. lot of health issues. You know, he has a feeding tube and, um, but he, he was fine, but then yeah, your son was hospitalized. Yeah. And he had, he had bizarre symptoms because, um, the, the, um, the symptoms that he had, especially back in March were not associated with COVID-19. So his very first symptom was abdominal pain. He, he started crying at dinner one time, mommy, my tummy really hurts. It really hurts. I don't want to eat. You know, I, I feel like I have to throw up. Um, and so he had really bad abdominal pain and then headaches. He kept saying his head hurt. And that night, the first night he was sick, he had hallucinations. I mean, literally wow. he was like seeing, you know, scary people in his room and hearing really mean, mean voices, right? And so that that flipped me out, right? I was going to say, like, you oh, must have been scared to yeah. death. I mean. <gasps> and so, and his fever never went above like 100.7 was the highest. So low fever. He never had a cough. 107? No, 100.7. Oh, 7. I was like 100. Yeah. <laughs> what? 100.7. No wonder he was hallucinating. <laughs> <laughs> yes, because you can hallucinate with high fevers, but he never had a high fever. He never had um, had a cough. 
maybe a little bit of shortness of breath, but I was watching his oxygen levels and they started to dip down, down, down. Um, and once he got to uh, a low number, I'm like, we have to go to the hospital. Um, I was actually giving him oxygen at home because as a physician, I can order it. I would, I would never recommend, you know, for your children, if your children are sick enough that they need oxygen, don't manage it at home. Like I yeah. did, like, don't be, don't be a, a mommy doctor. Right. Um, but, but, you know, at a certain point, I'm like, this is, it's too stressful. We can't do this. So I brought him to the hospital um, and they gave him oxygen, just like I was doing at home. Um, nothing different. Right. But we were able to leave the hospital within, I mean, less than a day and a half. And I did do a couple of things. Right. I mean, I did, I gave him melatonin, which there was increasing uh, evidence that that helpful in modulating the immune response, you know, helping melatonin. Mm -hmm. And yep. I think of that as only for, Oh, I'm going to take that so I can fall asleep a little easier. That's I thought right. it. Yeah. But melatonin is amazing because it actually protects the brain and it's really, mm -hmm, and it supports the immune system. So, so, so I gave him that. Okay. So I'm, I'm writing these things down. <laughs> so melatonin. Um, yeah. And I was giving him, I had already started um, high doses of vitamin C and glutathione, which is our master antioxidant. <clears throat> I gave him a couple of other things from a functional medicine standpoint that I knew would help support a healthy immune response. There's something called specialized pro-resolving mediators. Um, and there's something called serum derived bovine immunoglobulin, which right now Spain uh, is, is studying for use in patients who are hospitalized with COVID. Okay. Uh, so I'm really, shocked. You didn't say zinc. I hear everybody go zinc. You have to take, oh, zinc. you know, I had been giving him zinc all along, right. Even oh, okay. As preventive. Okay. So I did continue him on that, but I think the things that made the biggest difference once we were in the hospital were the melatonin, the actually vitamin D, the, the SPMs and SBIs. So those, those, but I, I, I will tell you one of the things that made the biggest difference that I could literally see because he was monitored 24 seven was, was the breath work, right? Breath was work. the, was okay. the gratitude, you know, when his oxygen levels start to drop and I would start to freak out and be like, Bodhi, are you okay? How are you feeling? And he would get worked up and I could see on the monitor that his oxygen levels were dropping. And at one point he'd be, he told me, mommy, stop, you're scaring me. And his oxygen levels would drop even more. So what, what we would do at that point, first of all, I had to calm myself, right? I would calm myself, right? And I would have him stand up and we would start doing our, our what's called square breathing. It's a little kid's app that we would just look and I'd say, let's practice our square breathing, which is basically belly breathing. Um, and we, we'd sit up and we at, out loud said our healing mantras, right? I mean, I, I just made them up, but we just said, my body is strong. My lungs are strong. I'm getting stronger and stronger every day. Mm. And literally within, I mean, minutes, his oxygen levels would pop back up and, and most of the time higher to where they were even before we started. So I could see right there. I mean, just the power of just calming, engaging your parasympathetic, allowing your lungs to fully fill, you know, allowing your immune system to, to calm down. Um, you know, it was so key. Uh, I think for me, you know, I that, that was you, such that, good evidence. That breath work, it really works. Mm -hmm. I mean, it really works. Um, just, I remember, you know, when I had my first child, I was like, I didn't, I wanted to have her completely drug free. I didn't want anything in her system. I wanted to do it all natural. And that breathing is what got me through it. <laughs> and I remember, yeah. And I remember when I had my motorcycle accident, I'm laying in the middle of the road. I'm freaking out. I'm screaming, call 911. You know, my femoral artery severed, blood's everywhere. <sighs> and there was a nurse that came over and she grabbed my hands and she said, I need you to breathe with me. Yeah. I'm like, that breathing works. That's right. It really when, does. when I have anxiety and I get like, you know, I try to turn my nervousness into excitement when I'm about to go on stage and speak, I breathe and I do push-ups because it kind of forces me to breathe, That's you know? Right. And so hearing you say this, I just had no idea that it would help so much with our immunity. Mm -hmm so much. And, you know, for, for parents who are just thinking about, well, how do I teach my kids how to do this diaphragmatic breathing? 
how do I teach myself, right? Because I, when, when I'm in the office and I have kids and parents in the office and I'm, I'm demonstrating diaphragmatic breathing or belly breathing, a lot of times parents have a hard time doing it, all right? They have a hard time keeping their shoulders down uh -huh. and really expanding their belly and, and using the diaphragm. Um, so there's, uh, there is um, a really cute Elmo video on YouTube where he's dancing and singing uh, the belly breathing song with uh, with Colby Calais and rapper Common. So that's super cute just to get kids kind of interested in what this is and like, hey, it's fun to do. Um, but then there's an app I mentioned, uh, the square breathing that we did with Bodhi. And he was able to access the square breathing uh, techniques because we'd done it before, right? When he was anxious about talking in front of his first grade class, you know, we, yeah. we did the square breathing. So there's an app called Stop, Breathe, Think Kids, uh, Kids app. And they have a square breathing. Stop, uh, breathe, breathe, think. Think, stop, kids. breathe, think, kids app. Okay. And um, they have a mission uh, these animated missions and one is called square square breathing and it's literally just a box and a fish goes up across down and across and as the fish goes up you take a big breath in as the fish goes across you hold as the fish goes down you exhale and as the fish goes across you ex you hold again so you just go around and around and what's fascinating it was it's only recently that i learned that Navy SEALs learn the same technique, but they call it box breathing because it, it helps them stay calm, you know, focused, um, achieve higher performance in high stress situations. So I'm like, hey, Bodhi, you just did something that the Navy SEALs did, right? Yes, yep. I love that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I actually have um, things on my phone to, I know this sounds silly, but things on my phone to remind me to breathe. like it'll all of a sudden pop up and it seems like it will come at just the right time. And it has, you know, it'll go, it'll breathe out and breathe in and it shows oh, it. That. You can, I have, um, when I wear my eye watch, I have it on my eye watch. It does that. And then I also have the calm app, which, yes. which I love because it will remind me to breathe. It will. And I mean, look, I even have, and a, a setting on my phone that reminds me that it's time to start getting ready for bed that reminds me, okay. And it, it shuts my phone down and it doesn't completely lock me out. Like, but it's a little harder to get into electronics once I have that set. Absolutely. And I think it's important that, you know, you said earlier about, yes, getting, getting enough sleep, eating properly, moving your body, but also to do things to get your mind in the right place breathing, meditating, and shutting off electronics. I noticed that is one thing um, that my daughter's been a little bit more in, on her electronics For during sure. this. And, you know, at one time they, I, look, I think TikTok's fun. It's really cute. And there's some fun things, but it can be very addictive. And just yesterday I'd noticed my husband and I were looking at my daughter's TikTok account and we're like, no, you really, you have to take that down. Nope. You can't post that. No. Nope. Yeah. And I don't want to be that mom. That's like hovering, but I also don't want her getting addicted to TikTok or yeah. Instagram or social media or, or, you know, what are some of the practices that you teach to help children, um, who might have, I'm not saying my daughter has an addiction to, you know, social media, but I think it is nowadays something that for sure kids get addicted to. What are some of the things, do you see that in your practice? Oh, or? absolutely. You do. Um, you know, screens, social media platforms, they were all designed to be addictive. I mean, let's face it. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, they, they were, they use neuropsychology, you know, tools and evidence to know what's going to drive that dopamine response, right? Video games, same thing, right? What's going to, what's going to get this person so engaged that they want to come back for more. I mean, that's, that's one of the best business models out there, right? Get them addicted. So they need it, need it, need it. And mm -hmm. so, you know, what I tell kids um, and parents is, you know, these, these video games, these social media platforms, screens in general, I, they were designed to be addictive, right? I mean, otherwise they wouldn't be here. <laughs> and, uh, and so recognizing that 
you know, we want to make sure that kids are doing things that uh, other things that can increase their dopamine level. So they're not relying on their screen, mm. right? For that, um, especially now where we're kind of sitting at home, if we're remote learning and we're just like, oh my gosh, I'm on Zoom all day. And I just, I, I don't have anything to really feel motivated and inspired about, right? So this is where exercise is so important, right? To get that dopamine and serotonin rush that many of us are really craving right now. Um, you know, hugging and connecting with others. Now, if we're, you know, we may or may not have our pods, but, you know, touch each other as a family, right? Hug each other, right? Because that really is so important for getting that kind of endorphin rush that, that you know, that we need. Um, especially yeah. now, right? More than hugs. Ever. Oh, I miss hugs so much. That's I'm a right. big hugger and I miss, it's weird for me not to hug people that I see. Yeah. I know. Um, and I mean, I hug everybody and it's weird not. And, and as soon as we can hug again, I'm going to be hugging strangers <laughs> on the street. I'll be just like, come here and let That's me right. hug you. <laughs> That's but, right. but yeah, yeah. exercise is moving your body. I think moves your mind and I can That's see right. a difference in, in my daughter. Um, I know when she's been on the screen too long mm -hmm. on school, uh, for Zooms on school and then maybe on social media or, or whatever, you know, she has her own business and she sells things through oh gosh, Instagram. So and so I'm, I'm really proud of that little entrepreneur that she is, but I see a difference in her attitude yes. and, and just, and, and how she feels. Mm -hmm. So I always say, okay, that's it. Come on, jump up. We're going outside yeah. and we take a walk or we go on our bikes or our scooter. And I'm grateful that we have the barn and she has her horse and we can go there and we can hug her horse. Yes. Yes. There's something so yeah. just healing and it just melts the stress away when you get to it do It really that. does. And, and I love what you just said that you notice these changes in her, right? After she's been on screens for too long, that's the other piece of it for children. So when we sit there, instead of as parents saying, do you see, right? How grumpy you get when you've been on your screens for so long? Do you see how much, you know, how you don't do your work, right? We want to help them notice, just, you know, tell, tell your kids, honey, you know, I know that it's important for you to be, you know, playing this game with your friend right now because you haven't seen them in so long, but I want you to notice how your brain feels, you know, when you come off the screen before and after, right? I want you to notice how your body feels. Mm -hmm. I want you to notice, you know, how, what your mood is like. So we're just helping them to notice so that they can start making good decisions for themselves. This is true with food too, right? Mm -hmm. Hey, honey, just notice, you know, if you've had, if you've already had, you know, some juice and then you have reaching for that cookie, you know, or, and, or the popsicle, just notice how you feel afterwards. Right. And, and notice the difference, right. Or, and notice the difference if we, you know, ate, uh, if we, you know, get a really great breakfast in versus the days where you feel like skipping breakfast. Right. So mm -hmm. when they can notice, they can make the decisions for themselves. Right. And, um, you know, with screens in particular, what I ask kids to really pay attention to is notice when it's really hard to get off. Notice when, you know, if mom or dad, you know, says for the second time, you know, and you've said, okay, just give me 10 more minutes. If you start screaming or crying or yelling, and it is so hard physically and emotionally to get off, that is your sign that you're getting addicted. Right. And that, that goes are, for adults too. For adults too, right? <laughs> that you are allowing, you know, this piece of technology to actually control your brain. Right. And so you Scary. have to decide who do you want to be in control of your brain? You or this device? Right. And then make those decisions to, you know, figure out a way to limit your time, whether it's setting an alarm or whether it's, you know, having, you know, um, an hour set, set aside. And then, you know, at the end of the hour, even if you're in the middle of that game, you're going to turn it off and practicing that. Right. But it's tough. I mean, this, it, it is not easy. And I certainly see, um, you know, kids and adults, right. Who are, are addicted to screens, especially the video games. Um, mm -hmm. And some kids, you know, I've seen some kids be so addicted that it is literally causing them to lose friends, family, high performing athletes and, you know, academic students who are now failing in school and, and really not able to stay motivated with anything. Um, in which case we need to treat it like an addiction and say, okay, a well, little bit there, is not going to work. There are actually recovery houses now for mm -hmm. uh, screen addiction. That's right. 
That's right. I, I had no idea, but we uh, saw a group of people walking the other day and I thought maybe it was a recovery house. Um, I knew it was a recovery house. Maybe I thought yeah. it was for drugs or alcohol, but I realized we got to talk into the, and they're, no, it's for screen addiction. And so, so yeah, yeah it's a thing. Well, there's actually, there's a word that I just, just recently heard, <laughs> which is, is, um, an actual diagnosis now it's called nomophobia, right? No mobile phone access, like this phobia of not, you know, being connected, which, you know, oh. is really, I mean, that that's a thing now. And so we have to recognize it. if you feel like, you know, if you can't go for a walk around your neighborhood without your phone on, you probably have nomophobia, right? I mean, unless, you know, you're, I don't know, if you're on duty as a firefighter and you're like, okay, I need my phone, that's one thing, right? Um, but, you know, I realized we have to recognize this in ourselves too and acknowledge our children. Mm -hmm. This is hard, right? Because I, I recognize, you know, for um, that it was hard for me to put my, leave my phone at home when I was going on walks with the kids, right? And now I purposely put it aside, say, look, no phones. And, and then they're like, what if we get lost? I'm like, we're not going to get lost right in our neighborhood, right? Like there's no need to have a phone then, right? Yeah. So practice it I, ourselves. <laughs> I realized that we went to a dude ranch before COVID and um, I had no idea there was no service there. I mean, none, yeah. no, no cell service at all. You couldn't check email. You couldn't make a phone call. You were in the middle of nowhere. And I freaked out at first. Mm -hmm. I was like, oh my gosh, what are, <laughs> I'm going to be offline for three days. And then after the first day, I, it took about a day. I it have to admit that. like a day. And then I was like, oh, wow. It was so nice to just get away and unplug. And so I think nice. that we could all use time where we just unplug and, and you know, kind of disconnect for our own mental health. Mm -hmm. That's a great practice. I, I remember we used to go to a family farm camp um, called Emmendal, which is amazing, but way outside of, of um, Willits and uh, um, no cell phone service, right? No internet. And I did have that same freak out moment, right? Actually, it took a couple of days for me to be like, okay, I'm okay with this, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, and, and so, but then the last three and a half days, were magic, right? It's back to the time. Think about when we were kids and, you know, you'd be running around with your friends and you weren't checking your phone. You were talking with your friends and you were climbing trees and you were, you know, biking around the neighborhood and, you know, really, yeah, you might've had a watch to know when it was time for dinner to head back home. Right. Yeah. But that's it. You were fully present and engaged in that moment. You and, weren't you know, videoing it to share mm -hmm. on your story. That's you right. were in that moment, living yeah. in that moment. And if you think about our children, most of us have children who are of the age where they have never had an experience where they've not been connected in that way, right? Mm -hmm. So I think that purposely planning like a long weekend, I think it does take a day or so to really get adjusted, but a long weekend when you're like, okay, you know, internet, Wi-Fi, cell phone holiday, it's off right? And you just, you practice that and, and do it as a whole family because it it's, can be really amazing how difficult it is for the parents. And then they can understand even more fully, you know, empathize like, okay, I get it. It's hard, <laughs> but we can do That's right. We can do hard things. Yeah. And that in itself builds more resilience. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Well, I want to have um, a link for uh, you you offer so many resources. I was just complimenting you before we started the interview about how how many resources that you offer for parents and kids and and just to have a healthy mind, body, and spirit and build your immunity and on your link tree and Instagram. But I'm going to include that in the show notes. So if you're listening to the podcast or you're watching this on YouTube. Just know that they will be in the show notes. All those links will be included, but you also offer courses and, and resources. And can you share the link? So if anybody's listening sure. right now, they can, they can jot that down if they need to. Absolutely. So the best place to find out, you know, information uh, and, and, you know, get my resources is on, on my healthy kids, happy kids.com um, website. It has articles. You'll see the list of courses that I offer. I hope 2021, right? As, as, as we um, leave 2020 
behind, you know, with, with hope and freshness, um, I definitely plan to be offering even more courses for parents to um, help their kids and help them, you know, help their families really thrive. But um, the course right now that's probably the most relevant is uh, an integrative and functional medicine strategies for the pandemic, where we, we go through all of what we've discussed, you know, how do we build up that cellular resilience? using food as medicine, targeted supplements, lifestyle. And then, you know, what do we do if we do get sick? Um, you know, how do we take that functional medicine approach so that we don't develop what are being now called long haul COVID symptoms, right? Those post COVID complications. And let me tell you part of, uh, uh, recovering from and reducing your risk of becoming a long hauler, totally about the vagus nerve. That's so much to do with it. So, so that's the most relevant right now. And I'll continue to provide as many resources as I can for free for families, because this is so important. Oh, well, thank you so much for all your share, all that you share and for just taking some time to talk with us today and share all your wisdom. It was so great having you on the show. And again, y'all check her out, not, not just her website, check her out on Instagram too, because she's always got events she's speaking at and I see free conferences and where she speaks as well. So um, anyway, thank you so much for being here. Oh, thank you, Amberly, for having me. It was awesome to be here with you today and I look forward to staying in touch. Me too.